constitute an axis of evil, arming to threaten the peace of the world. Given the impotence of the media, it's the duty of intellectuals to speak out, and they don't come much more intellectual than Chomsky. He's credited with the central theory in the field of linguistics that humans have an innate capacity for language that is hardwired into the brain. His very name has become a byword for the study of communication. This is Nim Chomsky. Nim, jokingly named after the great linguist Noam Chomsky, was the great hope of animal communication in the 1970s. But his politics inspire rather less affection. His comments post 9/11, when he described the U.S. as a leading terrorist state, drew hostile fire, even from allies on the left. But at 74, Chomsky shows no sign of relenting. In his speeches and writing, he has the gloves back on, denouncing Western greed and hypocrisy.、Uh, we need not rehearse the reasons、uh, why Britain and later the United States have been determined、uh, to control the Gulf region. It's enough to uh, recall uh, the observation of the State Department in 1945 that the resources of the region are a stupendous source of strategic power and one of the greatest material prizes in world history. His most recent work is entitled "Pirates and Emperors." I asked him first about the title. That's、uh, plagiarized from.、Uh, Saint Augustine, who in the City of God has a story about uh, uh, Alexander,、uh, his forces capture a pirate, and there's an audience between the pirate and the emperor, and、uh, he asks the pirate, "How dare you molest the seas?" And the pirate asks him,、uh, tells him, "I'm a small man with a tiny boat, so they call me a pirate." Now、you're an emperor with a vast navy, and you molest the world, but they call you an emperor. You know? And that's a, a good、um, allegory for the world, and in particular the contemporary world.、Uh, the pirates are the ones who are condemned, not the emperors. Of course, the general population is attacked by both the emperors and the pirates. So it's not that the pirate Saint Augustine is not saying that the pirate is a nice fellow. He's just saying he's a small criminal as compared with a major criminal. So who does control the world? Who are the emperors? Overwhelmingly, the United States since the Second World War, Britain before that,、uh, and、uh, concentrations of private power, which are enormous and uh, a tyrannical uh, corporation, is closely linked to the powerful states. It's a, a, ne- a network of、uh, concentrated power with other with insti- international institutions like the IMF and so on,、uh, which are called.、Uh, They sometimes call themselves the masters of the world. That's a phrase that was in the Financial Times, a little ironically, but not、uh, not wrong. Actually, they call themselves the masters of the universe.、Uh, Adam Smith called themselves the masters of the world. Now they're called the masters of the universe. We've gone a bit beyond it. <laughs> yeah, didn't have space age in、uh, Smith's time. But don't you sometimes need? Big government to deal with big business. That in a sense there is a kind of balance between these large forces.、Yes. It's like saying there's a balance between two members of the board of directors of General Motors. Yes, there's a, there's some kind of a balance, but they're so closely interlinked and they're connected that they're、uh, uh, to first approximation they're the same thing. Now, did September the 11th, do you think, mark a change in world politics? A historic event. It was the first time in hundreds of years that、uh, the West, Europe, and its offshoots. Have、uh, suffered the kind of、uh, criminal atrocity that they constantly uh, uh, carry out against others, which is quite a change. It's why there's such shock in the West. This kind of thing we do to you, you don't do it to us. I mean, it's like the、uh, reaction in、uh, England when,、uh, at the time of the、um, so-called Indian Mutiny rebellion in India, tremendous shock that they should do to us what we do to them all the time. It as an opportunity to uh, uh, intensify uh, repressive and、uh, sometimes violent actions, and that's just what's happened. So the Russians、uh, took it as an opportunity to step up their atrocities in Chechnya,、uh, assuming correctly that they would be authorized by Washington, at least tacitly, 
Uh, China did the same in Western China, uh, Indonesia and Aceh, uh, Israel and the occupied territories, uh, and run through the list. Uh, and the, uh, I mean, countries ranging from the Central Asian dictatorships to uh, democratic societies like the United States and others uh, have used it as an opportunity to clamp down on their own citizens. Now, looking at the uh, the current situation, when do you think is it right to intervene in the affairs of another nation? I think there are conditions under which that would be possible. I mean, one basic condition is that other, that nonviolent, you mean violent intervention, that nonviolent means have been exhausted. That's one condition. A second condition is that the people of the country in which you're intervening uh, support the intervention. Uh, under those conditions, and you can think of others, uh, intervention would be justified. Uh, however, we don't ever apply those conditions. Take, say, South Africa under apartheid. Uh, there's no doubt that the overwhelming majority of the population would have favored uh, intervention, probably military intervention. Uh, the uh, other means had been tried for decades. Did anybody think of a forceful intervention? Of course not, uh, nor did I. Uh, or take a recent case, East Timor. Uh, during the ni 1999, there were very large-scale atrocities going on. Uh, the population undoubtedly would have been delighted in military intervention. Well, Britain and the United States did intervene, namely by supporting Indonesia. Uh, did anybody think of uh, uh, moving to do something else? Of course not. In fact, Britain was sending uh, jets to Indonesia even after the uh, uh, Australian-led peacekeeping forces entered. That's the way the great powers intervene. Now, you make quite a lot in the book of the fact that there is freedom of expression in America. But what you do point to is, is something more insidious, because you suggest that there is actually, though there may be freedom of expression, there's a control of freedom of thought. Now, how does that happen? It was understood back at uh, the time of the First World War that it's becoming much more difficult to control people by force. Uh, the popular struggles have led to the development of unions, uh, parliamentary labor party, uh, franchise extended, and so on. And uh, coercion uh, is just not going to work by force. So therefore, you have to control thought. Uh, it's very striking that the contemporary systems of thought control, which are uh, highly developed, very self-conscious, so you know, leaders talk all about it, uh, they come from England and the United States. Uh, so the British Ministry of Information, which any reader of Orwell knows what it was, uh, the, the, uh, that's from the First World War. It was aimed primarily to convert a, a pacifist population into raving anti-German fanatics. And it worked. And it impressed people. It impressed the business world. That's the of the origins of the modern public relations industry. It uh, impressed American intellectuals who developed the conception of uh, what they called manufacture of consent, control of thought. It impressed Hitler, who uh, blamed the German defeat on superior Anglo-American propaganda and vowed that next time Germany would be prepared. Uh, and, it, and it has led in, in England and the United, the United States primarily, England secondarily, to huge uh, industries uh, devoted to control of thought and attitudes because you cannot control people by force. But dissent has been growing since the 1960s in the Western world, I and mean, people are far more sophisticated now. I mean, even popular culture reflects the fact that anything from the X-Files to the film The Insider, that the idea of people discussing things, of trying to manipulate public opinion, I mean, that's highly developed now. Sure, but when people were uh, under the lash, they knew about it too. Uh, yeah, they, uh, people uh, are so aware of it uh, that it has led to tremendous cynicism about almost anything. I mean, nobody re believes what government officials say. Nobody believes what they read in the press. Uh, uh, people don't believe professions. It's, uh, it's led to enormous cynicism and tremendous uh, opposition. In fact, I, in my view, the more crucial things than the ones you mentioned are uh, opposition to aggression. I mean, just take a look at the current war in Iraq and uh, compare it with, say, the Vietnam War. It's a comparison which is often made, the protest. But the, the comparison is completely false. Uh, the opposition to the war in Iraq is far greater than it ever was in the, to the war in Vietnam at any remotely comparable stage. I mean, this is the first war in 
I think in European history, Europe and the United States, first one I can think of where uh, there was massive protest before the war. It's never happened. I mean, in the case of the Vietnam War, it wasn't, no, there was no protest until years after the war began. I mean, just in the last 30 or 40 years, say the United States, uh, the level of uh, civilization among the general public, not intellectuals, it's a separate category, but among the general public, it's in, advanced enormously. So do you think that intellectuals are not sufficiently engaged? Do you think they have become cynical? Intellectuals are a separate category. Intellectuals are mostly servants of power. I'm talking about the general public, not the intellectual world. They remain pretty constant. I don't think they're sub subject to these changes, except marginally, uh, of course, to some extent. But they're quite different. And quite generally, it goes right through history, uh, intellectuals have been servants of power. Take, say, the First World War. Uh, on all sides, Germany, England, the United States, France, uh, intellectuals were extremely enthusiastic about the war. Uh, th there were a few dissenters, and uh, the best known of them ended up in jail, uh, like Bertrand Russell, for example, or Eugene Debs in the United States, or Rosa Luxemburg in Germany. Very small group of critics, some of them best known imprisoned, uh, but most intellectuals were enthusiasts for their own country, and that's common, uh, and it remains common. I mean, intellectuals write history, so you have to be a little cautious about what they say about themselves, uh, and it looks prettier when it's written in books. So do you then think it's a failure of the left, then, in the United States, that if there is this um, feeling that, that a war is not right, that there isn't more action, more political action about it? Depends what you mean by the left. I mean, the left, what I mean by the left is out in the meeting with the public all the time. It's out in the streets. And so there are meetings of thousands of people. The, the biggest university in the country, the University of Texas, uh, came out with a strong anti-war uh, declaration. That's never happened in the past. Uh, you go to working class towns and thousands of people show up for demonstrations and meetings. Uh, that's what I'd call the left. It's not the articulate left. But then the articulate left is never permitted expression. So during the Vietnam War, you didn't hear them either. I mean, the New York Times, for example, uh, would never permit a uh, comment by someone on the left committed to the, uh, involved in the peace movement, maybe a sentence here and there. But that's standard. As far as your attitude is to government is concerned, I mean, you are, have been known for many decades as being an agitator against what you see as bad government. I mean, some people have wondered sometimes whether perhaps you could have, alongside the criticism, criticism offered a little more in the way of solutions as well. There's plenty of solutions. In fact, that's all, all I and other people offer is solutions. Uh, often the solutions are don't carry out crimes. Uh, that's the simplest solution. So if you want to reduce terrorism in the world, let's say, there's one very simple solution. Stop participating in it. Uh, that would, doesn't end everything, but it cuts back the amount of terror by quite a notable amount. So that's a simple solution. If you want to look at uh, other more complex cases, uh, take, say, the Israel-Palestine problem, I think there's a solution, namely the one that the large majority of the American population support, uh, which happens to be the international consensus on a two-state settlement that the U.S. government rejects. Okay, so the, there's a solution for you. Let's just follow the will of the American population uh, and uh, go through the list. For example, on, uh, on, on say, environmental issues, there's plenty of solution. Uh, it's claimed that uh, what you say is correct. That's what's claimed by the intellectual world, that no solutions are offered by the critics. That's just nonsense. It's just they don't like the solutions. Since you first started in political activism in the 60s, do you feel that you have made a great deal of headway? I think the country has made a great deal of headway, and I'm happy to participate in it, but it's not traceable to individuals. I mean, these are mass popular movements, and it's big changes in culture. But it's across the board. If you go back to the 60s, for example, there was no feminist movement, there was no environmental movement, there were no third world solidarity movements. Uh, there was no substantial anti-nuclear movement, uh, no global justice movements. I mean, these are all developments of the last 20 or 30 years, and they come from all over the place. For example, the solidarity movements, which are quite un un unique. There's never been a time when uh, people from the aggressor country went to the 
victims and lived with them to try to protect them. That happened in the 80s. Tens of thousands of Americans did it, and they came from conservative circles. A lot of it was church-based. And it came from Main Street in the United States. And now it's all over the world. So you have people, uh, say, in the, the Israeli-occupied territories, in Colombia, and all over, uh, trying to help the victims. And yet you say there's this groundswell of support on Main Street, and yet you have a right-wing government um, there in Washington at the moment, and you have a great discrepancy between the way that the rest of the world increasingly views the United States and the way that the people of the United States view themselves. That's not true. I'm going to take, say, uh, the international economic arrangements of what are called the free trade agreements, so they don't have a lot to do with free trade. There's overwhelming public opposition to them. That's why these issues never arise in elections. If you take a look at the exclude issue, a certain category of issues, namely those on which the public is opposed to the elites, those just don't arise. Uh, and uh, that's, bec uh, that's part of the technique of marginalizing the public. And as you mentioned before, it's not that people are unaware of it. They know it. So before the year 2000 election, about 75% of the population regarded it as a complete farce. But in which case, I mean, where, what happens to transfer that kind of feeling into any kind of action? Because at the moment you have people who actually, although they may be in favor of the idea of more self-government, having more control over their destinies, they're pushed to the limits just trying to, you know, keep their families together, right. keep their jobs down. Kind of thing. There isn't going to be that kind That's of support. That's part of the technique of control. Well, it's never going to be broken then, is it? Well, why isn't it going to be broken? I mean, slavery was broken. broken. Uh, you look over history, one after another form of coercion and control has been broken. Uh, the Soviet system was collapsed from inside. Uh, you know, every system of tyranny we know about and oppression has been, people chip away at it and it ultimately collapses. There's nothing special about the, I mean, the ones that the, the systems of power that exist now are quite fragile and they know it. So the World Economic Forum, for example, is well aware. That's what the Financial Times called the masters of the universe. Uh, they're well aware of how fragile their control is and concerned about it, and rightly. What I wonder, though, is how you square your fundamental optimism about human nature with what seems to be a pretty pessimistic analysis of what's happening in the world. Well, a famous phrase that was borrowed by Gramsci and uh, that we should have... Uh, uh, pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the will. It's sensible. Professor Chomsky, thank you very much. And it's one, two, three. What are we fighting for? Don't ask me, I don't give a damn. The next stop is Vietnam. And it's five, six, seven. Open up the pearly gates. Well, there ain't no time to wonder why. Woo -hoo, we're all gonna die. Now come on, Wall Street, don't be slow. I'm man, this is what